The sutta today is uh, Sunyataka Sutta, Sutta number 105. Thus, if I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living in Vasali in the great wood in the hall with the peaked roof. The reason they think that this is unusual was they always had flat roofs during the time of the Buddha. So any, any structure that was peaked, they thought that was kind of special. Now on that occasion, a number of monks had declared final knowledge in the presence of the Blessed One. Thus, we understand birth is destroyed, the holy life has been lived, what had to be done has been done. There is no more coming to any state of being. Sunyataka, son of the Lekavis, heard a number of monks, it seems, have declared final knowledge in the presence of the Blessed One, thus. And then it goes through that whole thing again. Then the son of the Lekavis, went to the Blessed One and paying homage to him, sat down at one side and said to the Blessed One, I have heard, venerable sir, that a number of monks have declared final knowledge in the presence of the Buddha. Did they do so rightly or are there some here who declare final knowledge because of an overestimation of themselves. This is a problem. Almost everybody, even from the very beginning stages, they have the idea that they're much further along than they actually are. So, when those monks declared final knowledge in my presence, there were some monks who declared final knowledge rightly, and there were some who declared final knowledge because they overestimated themselves. Herein, when monks declare final knowledge rightly, their declaration is true. When monks, declare final knowledge because of overestimation that the Tagata thinks, let me teach them the Dhamma. Thus it is in this case, Sunyata, that the Tathagata thinks, let me teach them the Dhamma. But some misguided men here formulate a question come to the Tathagata and ask it. In that case, though the Tathagata has thought, let me teach them the Dhamma, he changes his mind. The way that he asked the Buddha was very offensive. And he had a lot of doubts. The thing is, he had been a monk before, and the only reason he wanted to be a monk was so he could be close to the Buddha and look at him, because he was quite gorgeous. And finally, the Buddha said, you have to disrobe. So he developed some anger and hatred towards the Buddha, and I was always trying to trick him into uh, doing something different. This is the time, blessed one. This is the time, sublime one, for the blessed one to teach the Dhamma. Having heard from the blessed one, the monks will remember it. Then listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, venerable sir. The Blessed One said this, 
there are these five chords of sensual pleasure. What five forms cognizable by the eye that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. Sounds cognizable by the ear, odors cognizable by the nose, flavors cognizable by the tongue tangibles cognizable by the body that are wished for, desired, agreeable, and likable, connected with sensual desire and inviting lust. These are the five chords of sensual pleasure. It is possible that some person here may be intent on worldly material things. The reason he said that was because that's what uh, the man that asked him, that's what he did. He was, he, he was very interested in material things only. When a person is intent on the worldly material things, only talk concerning that interests him and his thinking and pondering are in line with that. And he associates with that kind of person. And he finds satisfaction through him. But when talk about the imperturbable is going on, he will not listen to it and give ear and exert his mind to understand it. He does not associate with that kind of person and does not find satisfaction through him. Suppose a man had left his own village or town a long time ago, and he were to see another man who had only recently left that village or town. He would ask that man whether the people of the village or town were safe, pros prosperous, and healthy. And that man would tell him whether the people of the village or town were safe, prosperous, and healthy. What do you think, Sunataka? Would that first man listen to him, give ear, and exert his mind to understand? Yes, venerable sir, so too. It is possible that some person here may be intent on worldly material things. When a person is intent on worldly, worldly material things, he does not find satisfaction through him. He should be understood to be a person who is intent on worldly material things. It is possible that some person here may be intent on the imperturbable. Now listen closely to this part. This is very interesting because there's a rule that monks don't talk about their own progress in meditation because other people hear about it and they'll have doubts in him whether it's really true or not and that sort of thing. And it's a major offense if he talks about something that he has not experienced himself. And people for a long time, especially in the West, have this idea that means that you can never talk about your progress in the meditation. And that is far from the truth. And this is showing you that it, this is right. When a person is intent on the imperturbable, only talk concerning that interests him. And his thinking and pondering are in line with that. And he associates with that kind of person. He finds satisfaction through him. But when talk about worldly material things is going on, 
He will not listen to or give ear and exert his mind to understand it. He does not associate with that kind of person and does not find interest and satisfaction through him. This is why when you talk about other people and their meditation, uh, it's, it's not interesting. You understand that they don't understand, but you don't offend them by saying you're wrong. This way is the right way. You don't do that. You allow them to go their merry way thinking that you understand what they were talking about. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about the uh, lady from India who uh, was an anagami. Her name was Bipama. And recently I've come across some information to show that although she could sit for seven days, she was not an anagami. She never experienced the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. Consciousness was always there, which means to say she did not understand about craving and how to let go of that craving. She had great concentration, there's no doubt about that. But she did not get off the wheel of sansara. And she will have to experience that again. So, <clears throat> Just as a yellow leaf that has fallen from its stalk is incapable of becoming green again, so too, when a person is intent on the imperturbable, he has shed the fetter of worldly material things. He should be understood as a person, not bound by the fetter of worldly material things who is intent on the imperturbable. It is possible when some person here may be intent on the base of nothing. When a person is intent on the base of nothingness, only talk concerning that really interests them. And his thinking and pondering are in line with that. And he associates with that kind of person and finds satisfaction through him. But when talk about the imperturbable is going on, he will not listen to or give ear or exert his mind to understand it. He does not associate with that kind of person and does not find satisfaction through him. Just like a thick stone that has split in two cannot be joined together again, so too Sunakata. When a person is intent on the base of nothingness, his fetter for the imperturbable has been split. He should understand as a person not bound by that fetter of the imperturbable, who is intent on the base of nothingness. It is possible that some person may be intent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception. Now this particular state of mind <clears throat> is much easier to attain than most people doing other meditation. They might take five, eight, 10 years before they can get to that state. But probably 
more than 75% of my students in a 10-day retreat attain to that level. But people that don't know about it, they'll say, no, that's impossible. Nobody can do it that fast. But we know that it is attainable. It is not difficult like it is if you practice without using the six R's. And again, I, I run across many people like that. <clears throat> Excuse me. And I don't, I don't argue with them about it. I listen attentively to what they say. It's not really very interesting what they're talking about. But I let them do their path. Now, when they are in the jhana, whatever jhana it happens to be, when they're in the jhana, their mind is pure because there are no hindrances that arise. It's when they come out of that jhana and lose their concentration, that is when the craving starts to come up and there's no real personality change because of that. The real personality change comes from using the six R's. And it is quite interesting, for me at least, to see the change in personality and the change in people's face when they have these kind of attainments. Their face becomes bright and clear and very radiant. And almost everybody that gets to that state, I start talking to them about how clear their, their face is, how, how they've lost years off of their face. And that's really beautiful. So for me, that, that shows me that they're really doing the work. They're really doing the practice and they're being successful with the practice because their face is so vital and alive and young looking. Okay, when a person is intent on the base of neither perception or non-perception, only talk concerning that interests him. And his thinking and pondering are in line with that. And he associates with other people that have the same kind of level of meditation. And they bet actually wind up teaching each other. Because one person can say, well, I tried this and it didn't work and I don't know what to do. And the person that they're talking with will say, well, I tried this and it seemed to work quite well. So maybe you ought to try and doing it this way. So the idea of not talking to other people about your spiritual development is really a false idea. It's not something that you need to discuss with other people. But discussing with people that are not necessarily at the same level, but close to it, then you can discuss with them and help them clear up their problems. And he finds satisfaction through them. And yeah, of course you have satisfaction. That's why it's so much fun to, for me to talk to people that have already been here. Because they understand what I'm talking about. I know that people that just begin, it's a mystery what I'm talking about. 
Well, you're you're way too advanced a teacher for me to understand. But what do I tell you when you first come and do a retreat with me? The first day, I always say something to the effect that you're going to be a lot smarter when you get off the retreat than when you're on the retreat, when you're before you get on the retreat. And they are, because they have direct experience. And I spend a lot of time telling people that they are teaching themselves through the direct experience. Because you know when you make a mistake, what to do with that, how to take care of that. You know for yourself. Why? Because you have the direct experience. So it's real important for you to understand there, there is no guru. And I'm not your teacher. You teach yourself. I guide to make sure you're still on the path, to remind you of something that you've forgotten. But that's only being a guide. The Buddha is our teacher. He's the one that came up with this. He's the one that spent 45 years telling people the same thing in different ways over and over and over and over again. The suttas are truly remarkable. And one of the magical things about the suttas is that you can read the same sutta over and over and over again, and all of a sudden you get this insight into, oh, that's what this means. And it, it's great fun to read the suttas, not because you have to, but because it's fun to do. It really is. So it's amazing to see how much you understand when you go and read a sutta over and over again. And it's really wonderful. I don't know how to express it any other way. It is wonderful. Anyway. Suppose a person has eaten some delicious food and thrown it up. What do you think? Could that man have any desire to eat that food again? Not hardly. <laughs> no, venerable sir. Why is that? Because that food is considered repulsive. So too, when a person is tent on the base of neither perception nor non-perception, his fetter of the base of neither of, of nothingness has been rejected. Doesn't mean your mind won't go back to that. It just means while your mind is in neither perception or non-perception, that you don't have any interest in being in the realm of nothingness. He should be understood as a person not bound by the fetter of the base of nothingness, who is intent on the base of neither perception or non-perception. It is possible that some person may be completely intent on Nibbana. When a person is completely intent on Nibbana, only talk concerning that interests him. 
and his thinking and pondering are in line with that. And he associates with that kind of person. He finds satisfaction through him. But when talk about the base of neither perception nor non-perception is going on, he won't listen to it or give ear or exert his mind to understand. Why? You've already had that experience. It's that simple. I get quite a few complaints about this being too simple. Believe it or not. It is hard work, especially if you have to do a lot of forgiveness or whatever. You keep forgiving yourself. You forgive other beings. It's simple to do. All you have to do is stay with your object of meditation. But it's hard work because of the attachments you have to that situation or person. And letting go of that is not easy. But it's a simple process. The Buddha was criticized often about things being way too, too simple. There's stories about Brahmins that would come to him with these naughty kind of questions, and he would stop them and say, listen, I'm going to teach you the Dhamma. And he would answer their questions through teaching the Dhamma. And he, he was remarkable because of that. It was really interesting and fun and good to be around. He does not associate with that kind of person and does not find satisfaction through him. Just as a palm tree with the top cut off is incapable of growing again. So too, when a person is completely intent on Nibbana, now this is one of the things that I want to uh, caution people about, and that is the very subtle fetter of wanting to attain Nibbana. If you want to attain it, it's not going to occur. It's that simple. Why? Because who wants to attain it? Who's identifying with it as theirs personally? Who wants to make it happen? This is when I get a lot of complaints about, oh, I'm bored. That's why I made it a curse word with the Indonesians, I said, no, no. You have to not tell me about your boredom. Who's bored? Who wants entertainment? Who wants to see something just because they've never seen it before? So I don't wanna hear about boredom. Go through it, let it be. There are some different stages of meditation where boredom will come up. That's part of the practice. And that's just showing you that you have this amazing attachment that you have to let go of. So please don't ever talk to me about boredom, okay? Okay, uh, when a person is completely intent on Nibbana, his fetter of the base of neither perception or non-perception has been cut off, cut at the root, made like a palm stump, done away with, so they're no longer subject to future arising. One of the things that happens with the Tibetan community is they have this idea that there's this poisonous tree. And if they use the poison through, what do they call it? 
can't think of it right now, harmonious uh, use, that it can be a good thing. And they make fun of the people that are Theravadins because they want to cut it off at the, at the root. So there is no more. And they say, well, they're not as good as we are because we use that. And it's a major problem for the Tibetans. They have a few major problems that come along. One of them is the idea of reincarnating from one lifetime to the next. It just doesn't work. It doesn't go along with the Buddha's teaching at all. It is possible that some monk here might think thus. Craving has been called an arrow by a recluse, a poisonous humor of ignorance is spread around by desire and lust and ill will. That arrow of craving has been removed from me. The poisonous humor of ignorance has been expelled. I am one who is completely intent on Nibbana. Because he falsely thinks thus, he might pursue those things that are unsuitable for one completely intent on Nibbana. That's what happens with people that call themselves Buddhists, but don't know anything about craving. They don't understand craving. I was talking with David a little while back and I told him that I wanted him to put something about this in a uh, introduction to a book that we're just finishing up right now. And he said, well, actually what you're talking about is the Four Noble Truths. And as I thought about that, I would be, yeah, this really is the Four Noble Truths. That was an amazing insight that I had. So when I'm talking to you about being able to recognize what craving is and what to do to let that craving go, that whole time I'm talking to you about the Four Noble Truths. So that can clear up some of the thinking. Now, I, I spent 12 years looking for somebody that would give me that answer. And nobody could tell me what craving truly was. I got a lot of the, sta the, the standard answers, but no real answer. So when I found out for myself, I was truly thrilled and excited. And I did a lot of practice because of that. Going off into a cave where all I did was study the suttas and practice. 10 or 12 hours a day, that's all. That's not much compared to what I did when I was doing the Mahasi method. I was doing that 16 hours a day. The only time I didn't do it was when I was taking care of bodily functions and eating. So finding what craving actually is and how to recognize it and how to let it go when it comes up was major insights for me. And that's what I've tried to give all of you. The same insights so that you can see for yourself that what I'm saying is 
complete alignment with what the Buddha is teaching. It's really kind of fun. Okay, now he might pursue the sight of an unsuitable form for the eye. He might pursue the unsuitable sounds with the ear, unsuitable odors with the nose, unsuitable flavors with the tongue, unsuitable tangibles with the body, unsuitable mind objects with mind. When he pursues the sight of an unsuitable form for the eye or ear or nose or tongue or body or mind, lust invades his mind. With his mind invaded by lust, it would never, it would incur death or deadly suffering. Suppose a man were wounded by an arrow, thickly smeared with poison, and his friends and companions and kinsmen and relatives brought him to a surgeon. The surgeon would cut out around the opening of the wound with a knife. Then he would probe for the arrow with the probe. Then he would pull out the arrow and would expel the poisonous humor leaving a trace of poison behind. Knowing that the trace was left behind, he would say, good man, the arrow has been pulled out of you. The poisonous humor has been expelled with a trace left behind, but it is incapable of harming you. One thought of craving is harmful to you. This is where you get to understand for yourself that you are your own teacher. You, you are your own refuge. You break a precept, you feel guilty. You feel guilty, you have hindrances arise. You think and ponder on these unwholesome things and they keep coming up. So that's a problem. It's a problem that we all have, that we have to let go of. And when I say we have to let go of them, in order to progress more spiritually, we have to do that. There are some people that are satisfied where they are with their meditation right now. So they quit meditating and they just live their lives and they don't break any precepts and everything is good for them, but they don't progress any further. That's a choice they can make for themselves. That's fine. They can do that. But don't come and try to do more meditation of a different kind just because you're curious. I wonder what this meditation will do. Maybe I'll get some psychic abilities from doing this meditation. Yeah, maybe. But it's a big so what? I'm only interested in the final results. And that's what made me different when I started teaching this. That made me very much different from other practices. Well, if I do this practice, I can become a healer. Yeah, you can. So, what's the final result of your practice? Well, somebody gets healthy. Okay, good. And that's honestly good, but it's still a so what? Getting off the wheel 
letting go of these oceans and oceans of suffering that we cause ourselves, letting these go is the reason that I am here to help you see that for yourself. And so you can experience it for yourself. So this person that had the arrow taken out, they can eat only suitable food, do not eat unsuitable food, or else the wound will separate. From time to time, wash the wound. From time to time, anoint the opening so that pus and blood do not cover the wound, opening of the wound. Do not walk around in the wind, in the sun, or else dust and dirt may infect the opening of the wound. Take care of your wound, good man. See to it that the wound heals. That, moon would, that man would think the arrow has been pulled out, the poisonous humor has been expelled with no trace, and it is incapable of harming me. He would eat unsuitable food and the wound would separate. It means not heal. He would not wash the wound from time to time, would not anoint its opening with, from time to time. And pus and blood would cover the opening of the wound. He would walk around in the wind and sun and dust and dirt would infect the opening of the wound. He would not take care of his wound and would, would see, nor would he see to it that the wound heals. Then, <clears throat> both because he does not, he is, he is unsuitable and because the foul poisonous humor is not expelled with a trace of, <coughs> excuse me, with a trace left, the wound would swell and at swelling, he would incur death or deadly suffering. The Buddha was a teacher, but he was also a healer. He taught us how to take care of these things, but we have to do it for ourselves. And if we don't take care of it ourselves, we're gonna continue suffering and not just a little bit. We will suffer a lot. So too, it is possible that some monk here might think thus, craving has been called an arrow by the recluse. The poisonous humor of ignorance is spread about by him. Desire, lust, and ill will will increase. That arrow of craving has been removed from him that poisonous humor of ignorance has been expelled. I am completely intent on Nibbana. That just means pointing your mind in the direction of the wholesome, remembering to use your six R's. And the more you use your six R's, the more joy you have in your life. Because he falsely thinks of himself thus, he might pursue those things that are unsuitable for one completely intent on Nibbana. With his mind invaded by lust, he would incur death or deadly suffering. For it is the death of a, the disciple of the noble ones when one abandons the training and reverts to the low life. And it is deadly suffering when one commits that some defiled offense. 
it is possible that some person might think thus, craving has been called an arrow by the recluse. The poisonous humor of ignorance is spread by desire, lust, and ill will. That arrow of craving has been removed from me. The poisonous humor of ignorance has been expelled. I am one who is completely intent on Nibbana. You can be intent on Nibbana doing other practices. Your intention is correct. Your intention is pure, but you still have this arrow sticking through you with the poison of craving. So it's very interesting to see for yourself how you cause your own pain and suffering. And as you go deeper in the practice, you start saying, well, I don't want to do that to myself. And even if you become a sotapanna and you happen to break a precept, you're going to feel very guilty. And you know that you have to do something to let that go. So you forgive yourself for making a mistake. Then you take the precepts again. You only have five precepts. I, mean, I have 227 of them. And some of them are real minor little breaks, but they still make your mind feel guilty. So you have to let them go. then you make a very strong determination. I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to cause myself this suffering. Doesn't make sense anymore. An amazing thing starts to happen to you. The people that are intent on causing themselves suffering and causing themselves so much pain as friends, they will start to fall away on their own. They're just not interested in being around you anymore. Even though you might be super strong in loving kindness and compassion, they just won't be interested in being around you. So you start having more and more friends that act the same way that you do. That keep the precepts, that keep their practice going. Why? Because you're comfortable with them. You want to be around them. And you have fun with them. I have a lot of fun with the students that have come here that have done the practice and they want to do some more. I have a lot of fun with them. And we tend to laugh quite a bit. We tend to enjoy each other's company a lot. So that's why I ask people, why don't you come back and do this again? This is good. It's not because I'm attached to you. I love you dearly. But... It's not an attached kind of love. <coughs> it's the kind of love that is universal. I love everybody. Even if they are not keeping their precepts very well. I can still love them and have compassion towards them. Doesn't matter. Now you're starting to see more and more the clarity of mind that you get as you progress in the meditation. And the true fun you have with other people that are doing the same thing. 
It's really interesting. So, Okay, suppose a man were wounded by an arrow thickly smeared with poison, and his friends and companions, his kinsmen and relatives, brought a surgeon. The surgeon would cut out the opening of the wound with a knife, then he would probe for the arrow with a probe, then he would pull out the arrow and expel the poisonous humor without leaving a trace behind. Knowing no trace was left behind, he would say, good man, the arrow has been pulled out from you, the poisonous humor has been expelled with no trace of poison left and it's incapable of harming you. Eat only suitable food. Do not eat suitable and do not eat unsuitable food or else the wound may separate. From time to time, wash the wound. From time to time, anoint its opening. So pus and blood do not cover the opening of the wound. Do not walk around in the wind and sun or else dust and dirt may infect the opening of the wound. Take care of your wound, good man. See to it that the wound heals. The mad one think the arrow's been pulled out from, from me. We can't. rely on our karma not to have bad things happen to us. We have all done things to cause these kind of problems for other people. And because of that, there is a balance that needs to happen. So you can have bad things happen to you. You can die early, you can die young. But because of your practice, you will be reborn in an uplifted state where you have the opportunity to continue on. A lot of, a lot of beings in the Deva Loka, a lot of beings in the Brahma Lokas, they still do meditation. And they purify themselves and they do progress. And as they progress, they will eventually get off of the wheel of samsara. They'll not be reborn as a human being anymore. They will be uplifted. And they're a heck of a lot of fun to be around. I, I can't stress that enough. I really, really do enjoy very much being around people that are spiritually advanced. I wind up laughing a lot, not belly laughs, just kind of little chuckles that happen all the time. Anyway, the poisonous humor has been expelled with no trace left behind. And it's incapable of harming you. What is that poisonous humor? It is craving. It is the attachments. Now, more and more, I've been telling people they have to do forgiveness meditation. It's real important that they do it until they feel true relief. It doesn't mean that some of the past things that you've done won't come back and bite you, they will. But your attitude towards them changes. Your attachment to that pain goes away. And you won't have that problem ever again. 
he would eat suitable food and the wound would not separate. From time to time, he would wash the wound. From time to time, he would anoint its opening. And pus and blood would not cover the opening of the wound. He would not walk around in the wind and sun and dust and dirt would not infect the opening of the womb. He would take care of his wound and would see to it that the wound heals. Then both because he does what is suitable and because the foul poisonous humor has been expelled from with no trace left behind, the wound would heal and heal fairly fast. One of the things I noticed with myself, I have a wood burning stove and every now and then I touch something that's really, really hot. So what I do is I start forgiving that for happening. I forgive myself for doing it to myself. I forgive the hot spot for being there. And when I forgive it, it heals in a day or two. Now, this is for real. If I don't, sometimes I like to experiment and not do anything to it. It's going to be that, that wound is going to be around for, oh, 10 days, two weeks, maybe even longer, depending on the severity of the burn. And you've all heard me talk about how I like to break my toes for some reason or another. And when I put loving kindness into it, it doesn't hurt near as long. And in three or four days, it's healed. No pain. So... What is pain? Pain is telling you that your body needs loving kindness in that area. Now, forgiveness is a form of loving kindness. It's acceptance. And being grateful for the opportunity to learn from healing yourself is important stuff. So the more you can remember to do that, the easier life becomes. And keeping your precepts is a kind of protection for you. You really do protect yourself from painful things when you keep the precepts. And life becomes very much more manageable and fun. Even when you have this kind of pain that can arise from whatever your body is up to. You put loving kindness and forgiveness into that area. The blood naturally flows to that area. And it brings more oxygen and that heals that area very quickly. I mean, I've, I've had x-rays on my feet when I broke a toe. Just one time I did that because there's nothing they can do for a broken toe. And I went back to the doctor so he could check out how my toe was doing. And I told him that there, I don't have any more pain. And he would grab my toes and, and move them in all kinds of weird ways just to test to see whether it had healed or not. And it had. And he said, what are you doing? Oh, I, I'm just loving my toe more and more. 
And they just shake their head and say, you're doing something and I don't understand it, but it works. So do it again if you have that problem again. So the more you put loving kindness into an area in your body that hurts, the less you will suffer. And you're not doing it as a stick to make the pain go away. You're doing it so you accept the fact that that pain is there and it's okay for it to be there. It's okay because that's the truth. It's there. It has to be okay. So the more you put your loving kindness into that area, the less suffering you will do. And I don't care whether it's a mental problem or a physical problem. Same. You treat it in the same way. There are times uh, somebody in the family dies, there is going to be grief. But when you forgive that pain for being there and allow it to be there without resistance, that pain will go away. And then you'll only have memories of kindness and helpfulness when you remember that person that died. So you don't have to suffer for years and years. I've, I've run across some students that they've been suffering for eight or 10 years because a family member that they really truly loved had left. And of course, I give them forgiveness. And they work with that, and eventually, after a few days, that pain goes away, and then their, their heart is so much more open. And their mind is so much more alert, and their progress in meditation is very fast. I had one student on this last retreat that I just got done with yesterday. She did forgiveness meditation for six days, which is a, actually is a long time. And finally, she let go of that pain for whatever it was. I don't care. It doesn't matter. And the next day, she was sitting in neither perception or non-perception. I mean, she went through all of Brahma Viharas really, really fast. And the day after that, she had attained Nibbana. Well, it wasn't a shock to me. It wasn't surprising to me at all. Because she had learned all of the things that she needed to learn. It was wonderful. And the face, she went from looking like a a, a sad old lady to a radiant, happy young woman. And I look at a lot of your faces and I see, oh, your faces are so bright. Your faces are shining. And I see that inner glow. Yeah, that's just, it, it's remarkable. It's wonderful. It's exactly the way it's supposed to be. So let's get back to the sutta. So too, it is possible that some monks here might think craving has been has called an arrow by the Blessed One. The poisonous humor of ignorance is spread about by desire, lust, and ill will. That arrow of craving has been pulled out from me. The poisonous humor of ignorance has been expelled. I am one who is completely intent on Nibbana. Being one who really is completely intent on Nibbana, 
he would not pursue those things unsuitable for the complete intent on Nibbana. Because his mind is not invaded by lust, he does not incur death or deadly suffering. The three poisons, the Zen call this the three poisons, lust, hatred, and delusion. And that's just another definition of what craving actually is. Everything that is troublesome is caused by craving. That's the cause of it. And it's sad. That is a problem. But it's only a problem if you make it a problem. So the more you can put loving kindness and forgiveness into whatever pains you have, <coughs> the faster those will disappear. I have given the simile in order to convey a meaning. The meaning here, wound, is a term for the six internal bases. Eye, ear, nose, like that. Poisonous humor is a term for ignorance. Arrow is the term for craving. Probe is a term for mindfulness. Knife is a term for noble wisdom. The six R's. Surgeon is a term for the Tathagata, the accomplished one. When a monk practices restraint in the six bases of contact, having understood that attachment, the, the root of is the root of suffering. It is without attachment, liberated by the destruction of attachment. It is not possible that he would direct his body or rouse his mind towards any object of attachment. What relief. Amazing. Suppose there were a bronze cup of beverage possessing good color, good smell, and good taste, but it was mixed with poison. And a man came who wanted to live, not to die, who wanted pleasure and recoiled from pain. What do you think, Sunataka? Would that man drink that beverage or that cup of beverage? Knowing if I drink that, I will incur death or deadly suffering? No, venerable sir, so too. When a monk practices restraint of the six bases of contact and having understood the attachment is the root of suffering, it is without attachment liberated by the destruction of attachment. It is not, not possible for, for he would direct his bodily and arouse his mind towards this object of attachment. Suppose there were a deadly poisonous snake and a man who wanted to live, not die, who wanted pleasure and recoiled from pain. What do you think? Would that man give that deadly poisonous snake his hand or thumb, knowing it, if I'm bitten by him, I will incur death or deadly suffering? No, venerable sirs, so too, when a monk practices restraint of the six bases of contact, and having understood that attachment is the root of suffering, 
it is without attachment, liberated by the destruction of attachment, it is not possible that he would direct his body or arouse his mind towards any object of attachment. That's what the Blessed One said. The son of the Lekavis was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. I like this sutta. I've always had a bend towards healing. And so any, anything that has to do with healing, I have a tendency to pay more attention to it. But putting forgiveness and love into any part of your body that is giving you troubles will help overcome that problem. It doesn't mean that you don't go to the doctor and, and follow what the doctor gives you to do. You do. But you can heal much faster when you add to that your love and compassion towards yourself and all beings. So I've been talking for a long time. Do you have any questions? It's amazing how quiet it gets every time I give a dumb talk. <laughs> Hi, Bante. Yes. Hello. Um, Hi. Uh, yeah, just a question about the book. You mentioned a new book. Any little hints about what it will be about? Uh, it's going to be the Anupada Sutta, Sutta number 111. It's my favorite sutta in all of the middle link sayings. Because it explains the difference between create or between the five uh, aggregates and the four foundations of mindfulness. It explains that there is no difference between the two. It's just a different way of describing it. And it shows you all the steps that you go through to experience Nibbana. So I like that sutta a lot. I'm going to be getting a few hundred copies of it for the first printing. And I'm going to be sending it to a lot of my meditation friends that are teaching uh, different kinds of meditation. And see if we can convince those teachers, because the more teachers we have, the faster the Buddha Dhamma will spread. And that's my, my goal for this lifetime is to spread as much goodwill and happiness as I possibly can. So if you want some extra copies of it, we'll send you individual copies. There's no problem with that. But if you want extra copies to be able to give to your friends, then let me know and I'll send you those copies. Now in April, we're going to have a, a conference of the teachers that are now teaching worldwide the twin. And We are making up cups, coffee cups, talking about that. And we'll send you as many cups as you want. So you can give them out and just that's another way of advertising this particular kind of practice. And it's up to you. I, I have no attachment one way or the other. 
So this was taken from, uh, this book was taken from a talk that I gave that was, I think I might have been giving it mostly to Ruth Dennison when she was alive. I was giving it to everyone, but I was, it seems that when I get around teachers that have been really sincere in their, in their teaching, that when I give a Dhamma talk, it, it's much more clear, more good ideas come up from those talks. Anyway, that's one of the talks that I gave. And it is good. And I'm not saying that from an egotistical point of view. Because I get I get hooked on, on listening to some of my own Dhamma talks. As as weird as it sounds, but it's good Dhamma. And I really like listening to it. There was one that it got cut short because we ran out of tape. And as we got to the end, I was going, where's the other tape that goes along with this? I want to hear more. <laughs> anyway, yes. Hello, Bancha. Hello. Um... I may speak for many people because I have your books. I listen to you on YouTube, but I have no direct uh, teacher. So I meditate and sit on my own and doing forgiving meditation and loving kindness meditation. And how can I make sure that I'm still doing the right thing, that I don't navigate from the path? Okay. One of the things that, that can be very useful to you is if you run across something you don't understand, then write to David. David always lets me see the what's written to us, and we will help you in any way we can. Another thing that you can do would be do an online retreat. So you've set aside uh, 10 days doing it at home and following the directions as closely as you can. You can be very, very successful. We've had a lot of people that have been extremely successful. Some even becoming as far as an anagami. Just, and I never get to see them in person. It's just following what they're doing, making sure they're staying on track and they're doing it all themselves. And you're certainly welcome to do that anytime. Of course, I would like it if you came here, but that's not possible for a lot of different reasons. And that's fine. But I'm, I, I want to help you in any way I can. Okay, thank you. Okay. Any other question? I have a question. Yes. Um, well, how I, are you, beautiful? Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Um, um, I have a thought which I'm very attached to and um, then in between I manage to let it go but as soon as I talk about it to someone it gets more power again so do your forgiveness meditation until you feel relief from it don't get involved in the story of whatever it happens to be just stay with, I forgive you for causing me pain. Okay. Mm -hmm. And do that until you feel relief. And it's like somebody takes, 
big boulders off your shoulders and you almost feel like flying because you have so much joy and you're so light. Sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Yes. See, I John, and I have this, this uh, migraine pain. So, so that time also I can use the forgiveness to uh, that part of the body. Yes. And it works quite well. I've okay. never had problems with headaches. I did at one time, I thought I did, and I was taking aspirin every day, and then I didn't ran out of aspirin, and the pain went away. And I went, oh, look at that. I don't need that. So I stopped taking the aspirin. But talk to your doctor about it. See what he suggests. We want to be careful with all of these kind of problems. There can be physical problems that need to be taken care of with some kind of medicine. And that's fine. But it will be taken care of better when you put your loving kindness into it and your forgiveness for it being there. Okay. 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 Thank you. Okay. Thank you. okay. I okay. know that's a problem that a lot of people have. Yeah. But it's a simple solution. That's why I love Buddhism because it is so simple. Okay. Anyone else have a question? Yeah. Uh, you have to un yeah. Yeah. Um, last time you said that karma is only um, not thoughts, but only deeds and speech. Right. That's difficult to understand because sometimes thoughts can be very bad or powerful or full of energy. It's true. But if you don't act on them, there is no wrongdoing. It doesn't mean that you've given away your, your craving for that. You still have it. And that's what you need to do with forgiveness is forgive yourself for having this thought disturb you until it goes away and then it won't bother you again. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else? Ask question. Okay. Good afternoon, Mante. May I have a question? Hello. Hello, Mante. Um, in the sutta you just given us, uh, it said that a person intent on the base of whatever the level of meditation he has. Yeah. The base of nothingness, the talk concerning him is only about that level. Right. So that in, in meditation, you might go toward that level that you've been. Yeah, that, and you um, feel very comfortable talking with them. Yeah. So in the meditation uh, practice, when you sit down and meditate, you might only incline to that level, so it doesn't come back to the, the lower level. Right. Yeah. Now, when you get off retreat, I don't give instructions on what you should be doing with your meditation. Some people can do uh, <clears throat> mastery of the jhanas and work on that. Some people, if they're very sensitive to feeling, they can start working with having the divine eye or divine ear arise. Other people want to continue on and go higher with the practice. You can attain Nibbana at any time. <coughs> it doesn't matter what you're doing. It can come up. I, uh, sorry, Buddha was, he was fanning the Buddha. And he attained Arahatship. 
So it can it can happen at any time with any kind of thing that you're doing at the time. Taking a shower, washing the dishes, doing mowing the lawn, whatever it happens to be. When it's ready, it will occur all by itself. And at the moment that you see the link of dependent origination, that's when you see the nibbana. Well, it gets it gets more and more clear as you go deeper into your practice. Yeah. Like when you become a, an anagami, when it first occurs, when you get to that level with the fruition, you will see very clearly the links of dependent origination arise and pass away three times. And you'll completely, not completely, but almost completely understand it. You don't completely understand it till you become an arahat. But it will be so very clear to you and how it arises with everything. Did that help? Yes, it does. It does. Thank you, Wante. Okay. Come. Okay, another question. At what point um, of your practice do you recommend starting reading the suttas? Uh after you have become a sotapanna is when it starts getting more and more clear. There are some suttas that are very clear, you think, but when you start going more deeply into it, you'll see how, how much more clear it becomes. So if there's some suttas that you use that you... Uh, stay familiar with, that's good. It's just that your understanding is going to change as you go deeper and see for yourself how this process actually works. It's because when you start reading the suttas, it's like a big forest with many, many trees and you oh, don't yeah. know where to go through. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good simile. That works quite well. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else have a question? Okay. And then let's share some merit. May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Okay, well, I will see you all hopefully next week. Thank you, Bhante. Be, well, be well, be happy. Thank, Thank you, Bhante. Bhante. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you, David and Bhante.